This morning we're continuing in John chapter 3. Um, John's gospel, you're, you're probably already beginning to notice, is very uh, dense uh, in the sense that it's full of um, spiritual truth. We're probably not going to be going through it very quickly. and We can't really do that and do justice, even moderately so, to everything it has to say. So this morning we're going to be looking at another few verse snippet. Verses 18 through 21, what I'd like to do is back up to verse 14 to give us a little bit of the context and then we'll pick up what Jesus says in, um, in as I've said, verses 18 through 21. So beginning in verse 14, we read in John chapter 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now we have in John chapter 3 been seeing that there is such a thing as a second birth, something that is beyond natural birth, uh, something that gives us a spiritual rebirth. In other words, gives us the ability to do things beyond the power of nature, beyond what we are able to do as we come into the world. We've seen, secondly, that this new birth is necessary to see God's kingdom in order that we may enter into God's kingdom. We don't need it to know that the kingdom of God exists, but we do need it to see its beauty, to see that it's desirable, it's something that's worth whatever we have to pay in order to enter it so that we will want to enter it through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the only way God is given. We've seen that the Spirit gives this second birth when and where and to whom He wills, that He is absolutely sovereign in the bestowing of this gift and that He generally gives it under the preaching of the gospel or basically under the communication of the gospel Which is why, as I've already prayed uh, in my prayer, that the Lord would give us the grace to communicate it in every opportunity that he does give. We need to share it. We need to be like seed sowers with a bag of seed, the gospel, and, and broadcasting it wherever we can so that people might come to know this blessing. And we also have seen why the Lord can give this new birth and how you can know that you actually have it. He can give it because of what he has done through his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you can know that you have it if you believe. So that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. Now Jesus next addresses the question, what if you don't have this birth? What will happen to you if you don't repent? Or if you do not believe? And he also gives us some further insight into how you can know whether or not you have actually do have this new birth, whether or not you have believed. This morning, I'd like for us to look at three things from the passage I've just read. First of all, if you don't believe in Jesus, you need to understand that you're already judged. You're already condemned. Secondly, you have been judged or condemned because of your spiritual condition. But thirdly, how you can know what your spiritual condition actually is, whether you are darkness or whether you are light in the Lord. 
Now, this, I think, answers a pretty important question because we do need to understand that we do we come into the world already condemned. We come into the world already judged. If you don't believe in Him, you are already under the sentence of condemnation, the Bible says. Now, he isn't saying here merely that you will be judged in the future, although there is coming a time when you will stand before God. Every single one of us will to give an account of our lives. And at that point, you're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He is saying that if you don't believe in in Jesus Christ, if you don't believe in him now, you have already been judged. You are already under condemnation. Verse 18. He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now before we jump into that point, which is a very serious point, I do want us to notice first of all the encouragement that is here. If you have believed, you are not judged, you are not condemned. You've already been freed. If you are trusting in Jesus Christ, if you have turned from your sins, you won't be condemned. You've already been delivered. You've already been forgiven. You've passed from death to life. Remember the thief on the cross. He was in the last moments of his life. He merely looked to the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. He merely looked to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and the Lord saved him. He delivered him from judgment. He was not condemned. The Bible says if you believe in Jesus, the same will be true of you. Jesus will say the same thing to you. You are safe. When you die, you will be with him in paradise. You will be with him in heaven. If you haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, I would urge you to do so because this is the only way that you can be saved, is by trusting in Jesus. Jesus said on another occasion, he is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only door through which you can enter into heaven. And I would urge you to do that, especially in light of what follows in this passage. Jesus says, if you haven't believed in him, you have already been judged you are already under the sentence of condemnation. Now, why are you condemned? It almost sounds like what Jesus is saying here, it's because you haven't believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, that that is the sin that condemns you. Well, in a certain sense, that is true, but we do need to understand he doesn't mean by this that that is the only reason why you're being condemned. You know, there are those in the church who believe that this sin of rejecting Jesus Christ, of not believing in him, is really the only sin that God will ever judge. They believe that when Jesus died on the cross that he, he provided a universal atonement that is not just potentially able to forgive sin, but actually does forgive each and every sin that has ever been committed except one. And that is your rejection of Jesus Christ and that, that one sin is going to send you into hell But you do need to understand that is not what Jesus means. Jesus tells us in another place that those who do not repent of their sins and trust in him will be judged for every sin that they have committed on the day of judgment. Even for every single word, not just for the sin of rejecting him. Jesus says in Matthew 12, verses 34 through 37, speaking to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers. By the way, that's not exactly the way we would think of how to win friends and influence people. Sometimes we think that uh, we're, we're just, you know, never supposed to say anything negative about anyone. But I do want you to notice there does come a time when you call a spade a spade and here Jesus does that. You brood of vipers. You den of snakes. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, 
and by your words you will be condemned. Now is Jesus saying here that the only sin that's ever going to condemn you is the rejection of Jesus Christ? You don't believe or trust in him as he's offered to you in the gospel? No, he says that even every idle word that you speak, you're going to have to give an accounting for it. Even every word, if every word, how much more every action you've committed in which you've broken God's law. For another, the Bible nowhere tells us that everyone is even going to have the chance to hear the gospel. I hope you understand that's true. The Bible does not teach everyone's going to hear it. The vast majority of people who lived before Jesus came into the world never heard it because God was dealing with just a very narrow line of people, wasn't he? The, uh, the line of, well, of, of uh, Shem and uh, through uh, Noah and, of course, Seth back from, from Adam, but it was very narrow, and especially through Abraham and through his children, there was light in Israel. But there were nations throughout the rest of the world who knew nothing about God's grace and mercy. The mass, vast majority of people who have lived since Jesus came never heard the gospel. There are billions of people living today who have never heard the gospel. That's, by the way, the reason why Jesus calls his church to do the work of missions and why he tells those of us who have the gospel to give it away to others. The vast majority of those who are in hell today were condemned without ever hearing the gospel. You see, they weren't sent there for rejecting Jesus Christ. Now, I, I don't want you to misunderstand that it is a very great sin to reject Jesus Christ. If you have been blessed by God to be one of the very few in the history of the world who actually get to hear this gospel, to actually get to hear what God has done out of his infinite love to save sinners by sending the one whom he loves most of all to die on the cross for all who will trust him. If you hear that and you reject him, you will be condemned like those who never heard it to begin with, but the Bible says your judgment will be much more severe. The Bible says the more light that God gives you, the more truth he gives you, and the more you reject, the greater will be your condemnation. Jesus says in Matthew 11, verses 20 through 24, then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now, what do Tyre and Sidon and Sodom all have in common? They were all destroyed by God in his judgment for their sins. Tyre was actually destroyed as a city and was wiped off, wiped off the map, literally. It was taken down stone by stone and thrown into the ocean. And as far as Sodom, well, you know what happened there. God rained down fire and brimstone out of heaven and destroyed those cities. Now, Jesus says it's going to be more tolerable for those cities in the day of judgment than for Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. And why is that? Because Jesus gave those cities greater light. He preached the gospel. He performed miracles. And yet, they rejected him. Now you who are here this morning who have heard the gospel but have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is a warning to you. You know what many people have perished without ever hearing. And if you hear it and reject Jesus again and again, your judgment will be far more severe than those who perished without the gospel like Sodom, like Tyre, and like Sidon. There is a greater punishment for hearing and rejecting the gospel. But again, we need to remember, that is not what condemns you. Jesus is simply saying that by not believing in him, you're actually turning from the only way you can escape judgment. Remember what Jesus says in John 14, verse 6. 
I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Christianity is exclusive. There's only one way to God. And if you're offered that one way and you reject it, there is no salvation. There is no other way. That is why you'll be condemned. But it's not for the rejection of Jesus Christ. Just by rejecting him, you're rejecting the only avenue of escape. Well, if you're not condemned for rejecting Jesus Christ, why does God condemn you? Jesus says, it's because of the condition of your heart, because you love darkness and you hate the light. Jesus says in John 3, 19 in our text, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Now everyone who comes into this world is basically condemned for two reasons even though Jesus is emphasizing only one of those reasons. The first one is because you're guilty. And the second one is because you're evil. Both of these are the result of the fall. When Adam disobeyed God as your representative, he made you guilty. Since you've come into the world, you've disobeyed God even more, making yourself even guiltier. But the reason you disobey is because Adam's sinful choice also gave you a sinful heart. A heart that loves what God hates and hates what he loves. Or as Jesus puts it, a heart that loves darkness and hates the light. You do need to realize that too is sin. To hate God, to hate his ways, to have that disposition of heart, that makes you God's enemy. And that in and of itself is sin. Now, sadly, we're not going to be able to go into that particular subject this morning, but we will this evening as far as how, what Adam basically did to you when he fell, what your condition is coming into the world. So I would encourage you to join us this evening, but let me say at least this much at this point with regard to what Jesus says here. The guilt that you have from Adam, the guilt that you have from your other sins, the disposition of your heart towards God, These are the reasons why God has judged you and condemned you. God is infinitely holy and good. He cannot approve the evil that's in your heart. He cannot look upon evil with with complacency or with, with satisfaction. He hates what is evil. And he cannot, because he is infinitely just, he cannot overlook your sins. God is just and he must punish every Sin. That's why Jesus said on the day of judgment, even every idle word we've spoken will be brought into judgment against us unless you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you are already condemned if you haven't trusted Jesus. You're not condemned because you haven't trusted Jesus. You're condemned because of your sin, because of your guilt, and because of the condition of your heart, because you, by nature, hate the God of the Bible. That's what the Lord says. If you're not trusting Jesus, if you're not repenting of your sins, if you're not walking in his ways, it's because you really do not love him. You're still his adversary. You're still in rebellion against him. Now, since that's true, since there are those in darkness as well as those who are in light, the most important thing you can know this morning is the condition that you happen to be in, where you stand with God. Now, you might say, I know that I'm safe. I know I've been saved. I know I've trusted Jesus Christ. I've confessed him before others. I've made public profession of my faith. I've been baptized. I've joined the church. Or maybe you don't think any of that's necessary. Maybe you just think you're a good person. Okay, well, you need to understand that isn't enough. That is not enough. Jesus says, the way you can know whether you are darkness or light whether you are saved or not, whether you're on your way to heaven or you're on your way to hell, is not by what you say or even by what you think, but it's basically by what you do, how you respond to the light. Jesus says in verse 19 again, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Well, since you can only know what your condition is in relationship to this light, it's important for you to know what this light is. 
Now, I've already told you in, in the service, you know, that light is used in a variety of ways, but the primary meaning of the word light, and especially the way Jesus uses it here, is he is referring to himself. Jesus is the light. If you have an NASB, you'll notice that the word light is capitalized whenever there's an image that's being used to refer to uh, deity. It's capitalized. That means at least the translators and the editors of this particular translation also believe that light refers to Jesus. And that makes sense in light of what Jesus says in verses 20 and 21. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Those who do evil, who are in darkness, hate Jesus. And they won't come to Jesus because they don't want their sins to be exposed. They don't want to be shown that they're guilty. They don't want to be told that they're on their way to hell. They would rather convince themselves that everything's okay and they're right with him and they're on their way to heaven. But those who do what's right because the Lord has shown mercy on them because he has given them the new birth that Jesus was talking about earlier in the chapter, come to him because they love him and because they want to live a life that's pleasing to him. Now, you know, this was true literally when Jesus was on the earth as far as who would come to him and who wouldn't come to him. Those who hated him did not come to him. Look at the Pharisees, look at the Sadducees. Those whose hearts were changed by the Spirit of God who received the second birth did come to him. Okay, this was true in the days of Jesus, but it's also true today. Those who hate Jesus, and that includes everybody in the world who hasn't received the second birth, will not come to him. When he is offered to them in the gospel, unless their hearts are changed by the Spirit of God, those who are born again by the Spirit will come. Those who aren't will not. So here's one test that we can use to determine whether we are darkness or light. What does this say about you? Has the Lord changed your heart? Have you come to the light? Have you come to Jesus Christ? Have you turned from your sins? Have you trusted Him? Well, you might say, like, uh, as I said before, yeah, I've done that. Well, you need to understand, it's not enough to think that you have. It's not enough to say that you have. It's not enough to tell others that you have. It's not enough to be baptized or to join a church. Your heart, your disposition towards the light has to have changed. Doing the things that I've just mentioned before as far as professing Christ and being baptized and so forth can possibly show that that's true if you have done those things because you love him. But there's a more obvious way that you can know whether you really love Jesus or not, whether you really love the light. And that is how you respond to his word. Now, the word light, as I mentioned before, can refer to many things in the Bible. We've seen that already. But it usually refers to truth. And, of course, it refers to Jesus because he is the truth. Remember what he said to Thomas, John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the Word of God. He is the one who reveals God. That's why the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, is so that He might reveal His Father to us, that He might explain His Father to us, that He might reveal the truth to us. Now, when Jesus left, He didn't take that light with Him, did He? Rather, He left it behind in the form of the written Word. So how can you know whether or not you love the light? How can you know whether you love Jesus? How can you know that you truly do love him and you don't hate him? Well, one way you can know is by your disposition towards his word. Do you love the word or do you hate the word? Now, if you really don't love Jesus, you're not going to love his word either. You're not going to read it. You're not going to try to understand it. You're certainly not going to let it examine your heart or your life, you're not going to want it to convict you of your sin, to tell you that you're doing something wrong. You're not going to want it to command you to tell you what to do. 
uh, you'll be characterized by what Jesus says in verse 20 of our text. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. If you love what is evil, if you love darkness, you're not going to come to the light of his word and examine your life by this because you're going to hate everything it says and all that exposure and that shame and you're going to stay away from it. Well, we do need to leave, of course, room for Christian imperfection. None of us really live up to what God calls us to do. But as a general rule, if we are light in the Lord, if we have received the new birth, we will love the Bible. We will love God's Word because it is the Word of the one whom we love. It reflects His character. It reflects His heart. It reflects, of course, His, his morality. What He believes is beautiful and we will find it to be beautiful as well. We will want to believe what it says. We will want to obey it. We will let it have its work. We will frame our lives by it. We will follow it because that is what our Lord Jesus Christ tells us to do. And that's how he tells us that we should love him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That also means that if you don't love God's word, if you're not reading it, if you're not examining your life by it, if you're not submitting to what Jesus tells you to do in, in, in his word, that means that your heart is still full of darkness. You need to repent and turn to Jesus. You still need the new birth. And if that's the case with you, you need to pray and seek the Lord for his mercy. But again, if you are doing these things, realize you can only do them because the Lord has shown you mercy. You can only do it because you are born again of the Spirit of God. If you do these things because you love Him. You know, one thing that the Puritans remind us of more than anything else is that anybody can do just about anything, right? I mean, God gives us a set of commandments. Even an unconverted person can think that they love them and can even try to follow through and do those things. But... Motive is always the question. Do you do these things because you really love those commandments? Do you do those things because you really love God? If that really is your motivation, you really do have the Spirit of God in your heart. You really are born again. Remember what Jesus again says in verse 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Your love for God's light, for His Son, for His truth, which is evidenced by your faith and repentance, is how you can know that you belong to Jesus Christ. That you have passed from life, from death to life, from judgment basically to forgiveness. That you are no longer under condemnation or judgment. And that Jesus Christ, really, when He was condemned and put on that cross and suffered the wrath of God on the cross, that He actually did that for you. Now, if you have received God's mercy, again, this whole chapter reminds you that you need to give God the glory for that. And that means more than just saying, thank you, God, or it's recognizing that God solely is responsible for that mercy. If there's one thing the Bible teaches us, and it's something we're going to see this evening from what Adam did to us, you and I could not have trusted Jesus. We could not have believed. We could not have repented except by the work of his Holy Spirit. Without that work, we would be lost. We'd be going to hell along with the rest of humanity. We would never have seen anything desirable in Jesus Christ. If you have received this mercy, if you are light in the Lord, shown by the fact you are trusting him and you are repenting of your sins, you are following him, you are coming to the light and you are letting it have its perfect work in your life, it's only because of God's mercy. You do need to give him the glory and the credit for it. And in doing that, not just say, Lord, you did it all, I did nothing. But you begin to live a life with even greater purpose to love him and to glorify him by serving him and serving others according to his word. If God has had mercy upon you, let that be an encouragement to you to follow him with your whole heart. You know, the Lord is not interested in having half of you. He's not interested in having 80% of you, 90% of you. 
The Lord is looking, the Bible tells us, for somebody whose heart is completely His. Our hearts are continually being divided, but God calls us to have an undivided heart, a heart that, is, that completely belongs to Him. That's what He's looking for. And when He finds it, you know what He does? He strongly supports what you're doing for His glory because if your heart belongs to Him, that's what you're going to be doing is what is honoring to Him. You're going to be serving Him. He's looking for somebody like that to support. You want God's support? You want Him to bless what you're doing? Make sure what you're doing is what, what He wants you to do. Make sure your heart is completely His and you're serving Him. Give Him glory in that way. That is what He wants. That is the goal of His redemption. That's why He sent His Son into the world. That's why He gave you His Holy Spirit so that you would honor Him. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Offer yourselves up as living sacrifices to God. Not just part of you, but all of you. So if the Lord has done that for you, that is what He desires of you. That's what He wants. That's His goal. But if you haven't become light in the Lord, as evidenced by the fact that you don't love His Word and you don't come to the light, and even if you think you've trusted Jesus, but you really are not in submission to His Word, well, then may the Lord have mercy on you. May He change your hearts by His Spirit that you might repent of your sins, that you might believe in Him and be saved. The only way that you're going to move from death to life is by God's mercy and grace. May He grant you that mercy and may He grant that you might seek Him for that mercy until in His grace you may find. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take all that we've seen and help us to use it to examine our own lives to see how we need to respond to this.